will now begin the morning's panel discussion. And uh, the panelists will, will include the uh, four uh, keynote speakers from this morning. Angelica Hilbrecht, uh, who is a senior scientist and lecturer at the Institute of Integrative Biology at ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, also, Dr. Judy Carman, who is uh, an epidemiologist and biochemist and director of the Institute of Health and Environmental Research in Kensington Park, South Australia. Uh, Dr. Patrick Matthias, a professor and senior group leader at the Friedrich Meischer Institute for Biomedical Research in Switzerland. And Jack Heineman, Dr. Jack Heineman, professor of genetics and molecular biology in the School of Biological Sciences uh, in the University of Canterbury, Christchurch, New Zealand. And Dr. will be joined also by uh, Dr. Sylvain Aubry, scientific advisor at the Federal Office for Agriculture in uh, Switzerland. Uh, the, his office, the FOAG, is responsible for risk assessments of GMOs in animal feed. Uh, Dr. Aubry studied molecular plant physiology and agronomy at the University of Rennes in France and also in Zurich. And he has performed research for about 10 years, mostly in biochemistry of photosynthesis in the uh, University of Cambridge in the UK and also at the University of Zurich. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Michael Baer. He's vice director of the Federal Food Safety and Veterinary Office and head of food and nutrition uh, in Switzerland. And his office is responsible for the risk assessments of GMOs in food. He is also uh, head of the food and nutrition department in Switzerland. He studied food engineering at the ETH Zurich and uh, completed his doctorate in nutrition there. And we're also very happy to be joined by Anna Gabrielle Wust Sossi head of the biotechnology section of the Soil and Bi Biotechnology Division of the Federal Office for the Environment, FOEN, in Switzerland. And the FOEN is responsible for the approvals for field trials of GM crops, the monitoring of, the moder monitoring of GMOs in the environment, and the development and implementation of environmental regulations in regard to biotechnology. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel. And unfortunately, we could go on for hours with this panel and with all the questions you want, but we're going to have to restrict it so we can all have lunch and move on. For purposes, I think, of, of informality, let's be on a first name basis among ourselves, panelists. And then the audience, we'll try to work in questions from the audience. Uh, we request that if you have a question, there will be, what, at least one or two microphones there in the audience? There's one here. So you will come up to the front or, or raise your hand and she'll come to you. So just stand up and uh, we'll do it that way. Um, I would like to get things rolling with a question for uh, Patrick. Um, Patrick, I, I and I'm sure the rest of us appreciated the fact that you said that you and your organization are very, uh, very committed to having an open rational dialogue based on the science about genetically engineered foods. And we all are too. So we're, in fact, that's why we're here today. Uh, and I, I have a few questions for you in that regard. One is, when you were making, trying to make a case that genetic engineering is just a logical and, 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 and the implication just a fairly minor extension of what's been going on in nature for, for uh, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Um, you, uh, you didn't really mention some of the key uh, factors that I and many other people think make the process of genetic engineering very different. For instance, the, the disruptions that occur through the a process of inserting the recombinant DNA into the organism, or the fact that once the genes have been implanted, 
they're not going to really express unless they are affixed to high-powered uh, promoters taken from, in most cases, a plant virus. Uh, they, now, those seem to be very unnatural, some, some things that don't happen at all in pollen-based breeding. And I'm wondering why you and the other proponents of genetic engineering routinely don't discuss those uh, aspects of the, of the technology when you're trying to make the case that they're just a simple extension of traditional breeding. Thank you for the question. Um, I think the, the issue is that um, based on what we know in, you know in other systems, and based on, on what we know, let's say if you express a protein A or B or C, and we, the expected effect of that protein, we can imagine what may or may not happen. That's the first thing, you know, there is a rational for doing something or not doing it. And then we have to test if this effect takes place or not. And if it does, we have to look at are there possible side effects? Are there things, unexpected events happening? And this has all to be taken into account. And if now you consider the, the newer techniques which are really coming, because you know a lot of the discussion we are having around gene technology in, in plants is really based on what you just mentioned, which are uh, models developed 20 years ago, really. Uh, and, and the science has moved enormously. And now we, are, we have ways to do things in a much more subtle way, in a much more controlled way, and in a much less disruptive way, in a way, you know, which would definitely, I think, go in the direction of, of what you are criticizing, you know, putting a big promoter from a virus or something. Today, we can do this differently. In a, and, and so that's what I, I was trying to argue, that the technology, one has to look at the use and the application of the technology, not the technology in itself, you know. The technology can be well used or poorly used. And what I'm trying to say is that the technology has moved, the technology is much finer today, and there are uses which can be good, I think. But, but, the, but the crops that are on the market and that people in North America and many other countries have been consuming for 20 years have been produced through those old methods that you yes. just now did acknowledge are more disruptive, that would seem to imply that they shouldn't be on the market anymore. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that if you are concerned about this, you know, these particular crops, then indeed we could do them today differently. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I do not think, with the evidence I know, I do not think that there is clear evidence that these crops are, are you know, uh, dangerous for human health. But according to the presentation of Dr. Carmen and much other research that could be presented to you, the, the consensus that you claim exists that these foods have been proven safe is based on, on uh, testing that is very superficial, very, uh, <laughs> Dr. Carmen's presentation I think clearly showed that uh, the testing is not rigorous. So how can, how can one claim that these foods have been proven safe if the testing is, is very, uh, very deficient? Well, I think one has to beware of confounding effects, which can take place in many, many studies. And I think that's why food testing, for instance, has to, or, you know, other testing as well, has to be done in an extremely standardized way with very clear and very strict criteria with also very clear hypothesis testing. So there has to be a very clear question asked so that you can then afterwards also do a proper statistical analysis. If the question that is asked is not very clear but is rather open, I can tell you, you will find something no matter what you look at. And therefore, and then it can be then become very difficult to interpret actually the significance of the finding. And, and it's not restricted to GMOs, it's almost anything you do. You have to know exactly what do I want to test, how do I to set it up so that I can test this, and do, is the, do the result that come out past the statistical significance criteria. 
and that's all. And then the study is done for that purpose, and that's it, nothing else. Otherwise, it's very hard. Uh, I think Dr. Carmen, Judy would like to uh, respond to that. The sort of um, approach you're describing is actually the second tier of testing. So the first one is to determine if there are any sort of adverse effects that you can find, really, and that's doing a, a general um, toxicology type of approach, the one that I described, where you feed animals uh, the GM crop and other animals the non-GM crop, and you compare them across a number of variables. And then on that, you would then, whatever findings you find, you would then go and confirm them in subsequent findings. So you then you undergo hypothesis testing, which is, in, in the case of the uh, pig study that I had, you know, we determined that there was a difference in the size of the, uh, in the weight of the uterus, for example. Then there should be follow-up studies done where you actually have that as your hypothesis, where your null hypothesis is there is no difference in the weight of the uterus. The alternative hypothesis is there's an increase in the weight of the uterus, and then you go and actually do that. But what you're describing where you actually develop an hypothesis and go and test it, that's fine if you've got an hypothesis test, which is a specific thing that you generate as a result of the first round of testing, which hasn't been done in GMOs properly, was what I was saying. I'd like to ask a question of Angelica that is uh, relevant to this discussion, and that is, uh, what are your uh, thoughts? Is it really true that a majority of scientists believe that GMOs are, have been proven safe, uh, or are there just uh, you know some outliers that uh, don't really count when it comes to consensus? Well, we have to start drawing groups of people and circles and networks of people now. Um, the consensus that is being put forward was explained also by Patrick. It is exists within a group of like-minded people. They get together and agree that they agree that they think all the same about this. And then they declare this is a consensus, but that's fine. You know, we can get a group of people in this room together and I'm pretty sure we will come up with a consensus today here that will be somewhat different and declare that as our consensus. That's not what we're talking about. Consensus is if you draw more than a group of like-minded people in a church or something to agree, yes, this is how we interpret the Bible or this is how we interpret this and we all agree, and then declare this as a consensus for the whole world. This is where I have troubles. You know, as a group of people who think about genetics and think about how genes work and share that view have come to the agreement that this is what they share, fine. But there is outside of it a large group of scientists. They don't speak on behalf of all scientists. And there's a lot of scientists outside who have very different views, very scientific-based, data-based. I base my, uh, I think I hope I made that clear that uh, I base my conclusions on data. And I have a good reputation of not being very romantic or sentimental. <laughs> so, and I, uh, you, I do have emotions occasionally, but uh, I tend to keep them out of science. So, um, my uh, arguments and my conclusions are rock solidly based solely in data. And that is my problem that I have, because when I look at these dossiers that are being submitted to the authorities, I find very little data in there and a lot of heuristic argumentation and declaration and extrapolation and, you know, the kinds I showed you. It's like because microbial BT pesticides um, have a long history of safe use, mainly because we didn't look, there isn't much studied, I said, where's the data? And then you go and look for the data and there aren't any data. It's like, so, okay, what, and what's the difference between what's being expressed in a plant and uh, have you accounted for that? And then you go and look for the data and then there is no data. You know, and then we go out and say, but there is no data. You know, I want data. I believe when I see it, I want to see experimental data that proves what you're claiming here. And there isn't any, and then I'm called anti-science. That's, that's a peculiar thing, you know. I have realized that people who start talking about emotions and accuse others that they're emotional and anti-science are actually themselves pretty anti-science when it comes to testing you know, where's the data that proves that? Show me the data. That's not coming out of um, a corporate lab, but you have to add. Because part and parcel of this technology is that it's patented. And that is also something I always find difficult to reconcile with the naturalistic argumentation saying this is just nature. 
doing the same thing. Well, if it were nature doing the same thing, you couldn't patent it. Patenting is a very strong property uh, endowment to something you have invented, you and you only. This is why you get a patent granted. How can you reconcile this with, oh, no, nature does it all the time? Well, then I would say then there shouldn't be any patents on it. Nobody should be owning this. That's difficult to reconcile. I mean, I really haven't heard how you can reconcile that. So that's, those are my problems. And when it comes to the consensus, outside of select groups of people who share one set of values, they if I can, Sorry, if I can just add to that as well. Um, I agree with um, what you're saying about, <clears throat> you know, within a particular group of people coming to a consensus. But the other thing are the qualifications of the people within that group. So if you're somebody who genetically engineers plants, you know how to genetically engineer plants. But it usually means that you don't have qualifications in medical research, you know, by definition. So, you know, I've got quite a few qualifications, but I wouldn't pass myself off as a physicist, you know, because I'm not. So I, my opinions on physics and particle physics are probably not worth thinking about or worth me expressing. So um, you need to have somebody who has qualifications and experience in the actual area of doing um, you know, toxicology research or doing um, medical research to be able who can then pass assessment on whether there is evidence that GMOs are safe or not and whether there's a consensus or not. And the people who tend to be saying that there is a consensus tend to be people who are not actually in the area of doing that sort of research. Um, I'd also like to add, if I could, to um, the BT aspect that you were talking about and, and the, um, the idea that, uh, you know, because BT has both proteins have been used in, you know, organic agriculture and stuff for so long, therefore something that's produced in a GM crop that is a BT protein must also be safe. The, they, when, when BT proteins are made in a GM crop, they're not the same as the naturally occurring ones. They're often truncated, which means they're, just, they're not as long, they've been altered, they've got a different structure. They're a synthetic BT protein. And as a result of that, they really need to undergo a specific test. You can't now assume that they're the same as the old BT because they're not the same, you know? Um, so you need, they need to go undergo proper safety assessment because they are quite different, really. Um, before moving on, because we should move on to another topic, I do uh, think it, I'd like to note for the record that the Royal Society of Canada and the Public Health Association of Australia are not outlier organizations and they both expressed uh, great co uh, concerns about the risks, the unique risks of the genetic engineering process when it comes to agriculture. And uh, in fact, the Public Health Association of Australia, just a few years ago, called for an indefinite freeze on the growing and on the co commercialization of genetically engineered crops until adequate research had been done to actually demonstrate they were safe. Now, during the break, a group of students, university students, approached me with a question, and I asked one of them to ask it during this session, so could could you stand up and then the microphone can be brought to you? Because it was a follow-up to statements I made and that some others have met, made about the disruptive process of the genetic modification itself. So you might want to follow up on that a little yes, bit. Yes, exactly. So there was a lot of talk about um, genetic disruption and genetic shock. So I would like to ask Mr. Drucker, um, to which extent it's different to, for example, uh, crossing over during a cell replica? What was the last part, please? Um, to which extent this geno genomic shock is different to um, crossing over during cell replication, for example? Well, I think there are major differences between uh, all forms of sexual reproduction, breeding through sexual reproduction, the unexpected effects and the disruptive effects between all those pollen-based techniques and recombinant DNA techniques that have been used up till now. And uh, the insertion process, uh, as, doc as uh, Dr. Carmen had mentioned, uh, the two main ways of getting the uh, packets of recombinant DNA into the target cells uh, are either biolistics or bioballistics, particle bombardment, 
which research has shown creates extensive disruptions, uh, not only to the, uh, to the adjacent area where the gene is inserted, or the packet, because it's more than just a gene is inserted, but disruptions throughout the, the genome. Also, the other main technology, using bacteria, a soil bacteria to actually infect the, uh, the cells with the packet of uh, DNA, have been shown to be highly disruptive all well, as well. And that's, that's well recognized. Um, then, and in fact, the, I think you might have been on a paper called Genome Scrambling. I mean, some, some scientists have, have documented all of the effects and said their genome scrambling is going on. Uh, Jack, do you want to add to some of that about this? Okay, but, but you want to talk about the disruptive effects or any, anybody else add to some of what I'm saying? Uh, before he does, I do want to mention, because I'll follow up on a point I made about the, the need for viral promoters to actually get expression of the genetic material that is inserted. Most of that will not insert, will not, will not express in a foreign environment if it's left on its own. So uh, the native promoter that would actually uh, regulate gene expression is taken off and a very high-powered promoter is put on from a plant, from a, from a virus that infects plants. And that actually causes the foreign genes to express outside the, the, the plant's regulatory system. They, uh, if you want to talk about outliers, those are the outliers. They are rogue agents expressing generally round the clock, unregulated. That's highly unnatural, and it, it's a forced overexpression, which in itself can cause many disruptions to the metabolism of the plant. I'll let other people maybe expand on some of those themes if they would like to. I guess I, I, I'd like to come at this from a slightly different direction. Uh, I know that I can select a spontaneous point mutation in my organisms that make dramatic changes, maybe even death. I also know that I can introduce those same point mutations using genetic engineering technologies. I don't personally uh, feel that there is, there is substantial evidence of any kind that says the way we should approach a risk assessment is by looking at the scale of the disruption. Now, scale of disruption can be an indicator of risk, uh, and where those scales overlap, possibly they do overlap in a, in a crossing over versus um, an insertion, I don't know. But I guess that's my point. Uh, measuring scales isn't how I would approach the importance of a risk assessment. So if it's a point mutation, or if it's a massive disruption caused by bioballistics, I still want to do the risk assessment. One point mutation can be important, and therefore these, the new genetic engineering technologies, the genome editing technologies, if they're going to cause an adverse effect, they may very well cause an adverse effect with one nucleotide change. I don't think that lowers my sense of the need for that risk assessment. But indeed, I think that these techniques, in some ways, increase the need for a risk assessment over what we see spontaneously in nature. I guess there's two reasons for that. One reason is that spontaneous mutations in nature take a long, long time, if ever, to, come, to grow to the scale where they're going to be impactful in the environment or to human health. However, if we introduce on purpose a point mutation into corn, we're going to grow it on thousands of hectares in a country that controls corn. And it's going to control where that corn goes, and it's going to make sure it's in your diets. Nature doesn't do that. So this is a fundamental difference in the effects of the directed nature of the technology. But perhaps in a more scientific uh, point of view, is that if we have techniques that increase the precision, or what I call the efficiency of the reaction, we may, as a result, decrease the number of different places in the genome in which that change, a change could be made. But if any one of those places in the genome, which we cannot accurately predict, would result in an adverse effect, then using these techniques, the chances of making that change go up many orders of magnitude. So there's different aspects to a risk assessment. It isn't as simple as saying the scale is important. 
the scale is indicative, and that's why the process is important for us to understand as an inspiration for a risk assessment. Or that because it makes smaller changes and in, in, in fewer places, all of those places will be safer for us or for the environment. These are not a priority. And there is no science to tell us yet how to predict where those changes are going to be in a thorough and satisfactory way. One comment, I mean, actually, I, I largely agree with what Jack has said, uh, but I would just like to give a precision. Uh, indeed, with the new techniques, we can make point mutation, and indeed, there may be some off-target effects. But the, the, the point that I think is important to realize is that we can identify these off-target effects. And let's say if the reaction is done, and then you, you derive from the reaction a number of clones, which are all derivative, and then you can sequence the entire genome of each one of those. And then you select the one which will have only the desired point mutation and no additional effect. And so in that sense, I agree with what you said, but you, you know, to give the complete picture, we should also say that today we have the tools and the technology to actually identify the one plant which will have, or you know, cell or whatever it is, which will have only the one desired point mutation and nothing else. And this is going to be totally standard. So we should not think that now there will be all these off-target effects all over the place. This one, this will not be the case because we are able to identify the correct ones. I think Chad would like to... No, uh, sorry, could sorry. I add to that as well? But I haven't seen it done in a regulatory body. Our food rig. Have you ever seen it happen, Jack, with Fazant? So where they've actually sequenced the entire genome and gone, well, we've only got this point mutation here and nothing else has happened? Never. Thank you. <laughs> but I guess I... Uh, it's marvellous in theory. I, 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 mean, I, mean, I think that it should though. be done, but it's not being done. Yeah. But, but Patrick says it's correct. I mean, uh, sequencing technologies are getting better and faster, so what he says could be the future. I guess what it means, though, is that we have to do it. If you choose not to regulate these processes, then they will never be done. So I guess the point is, the new genetic engineering technologies have to be, by consensus, determined to be under our regulations, or those important pathways of risk assessment and risk mitigation will never occur. Sylvain, at, at, at dinner last night, uh, you were making your point that uh, was consistent with what uh, a point I made during my talk, that our knowledge that the information system of, of the organism is not confined just to DNA and that there are many aspects, many parts of the information system are well outside the DNA and we don't understand all of them. Would you like to comment on that a little more in light of what this conversation right now? Yeah, definitely. So just a small disclaimer, just before. So we actually we are from the administration, and what we gonna so there, there's various debates and so parliamentary debates are going on. And just what we say here is actually our meaning, our meaning, and not the actual nothing to do with what's happening outside. So it's essentially my opinion or the, my colleague's opinion, which stays here and not the my actual office, so we we are happy to inform what's happening, but there's no binding to it, so okay. essentially. Sorry. <laughs> just, 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 to, sorry. Your, to your question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, essentially, I think it's what Jack very nicely showed before, that uh, we also should move out a bit from the DNA paradigm and move a bit down to what RNA is going, what RNA does and everything. But essentially what you're saying, or what I understand correctly, if I understood it correctly, is that we should basically focus more on what actually the, the nature of the change, the modification we are doing, and their consequences later on, and not really necessarily the way we are doing it. But we, it's informative to know how we do it. But then the actual key point is basically more towards the product. What's the actual um, consequences or potential consequences we have happened in terms of toxicology, but also environmental risk assessment? So is that, is that right, or would they get it? <laughs> so Anne and then Michael, if you could, if you'd like to discuss with us some of the research that you're doing and some of the, if you're doing testing on GMOs, the, the kinds of tests and what you're learning and what you think 
uh, the kinds of tests you think might need to be used more in the future? And if you want to also answer that question. So we are not actually need doing any test, or we don't have any lab or anything. But essentially, yeah, well, there's a lot of things going on, and we are carefully looking at the literature and what's available. But it's true, there's one point that's been very shown up, also the importance of the transparency of the data and the access of the data is something which I think comes back quite a lot in the discussion. And that's something we actually can, and it's also important to raise that essentially if you want to have a consensus, which is uh, likely to be the, the, the key, we need to have access to the raw data. And, check it. and I think that's an important point to, that it could be interesting to have, to, from our point of view, to have a perfect and a, as good as possible expertise and meaning and opinion, we need to have access to the data. Yes, yes and. It's the same, it's the same uh, thing in our office. We don't uh, make any research ourselves, but the research we, you make, actually, and all the data that we have furnished to us are very, very important. They are the basis for us to make risk assessment, extensive risk assessment and risk scenarios. And that's why, actually, the research is very important and also to assess the, the risk for the biosecurity in it. So, could I interject here quickly? I just wanted to ask first if Michael wanted to add to that, and then, yes, then you can do an interjection. Well, it's, it's, it's the same for us, that we are not doing any research on our own, but um, just one comment to what uh, Chuck said during this presentation. We get smarter every day, like your colleagues. Um, the one you quoted, that there is no risk, was a a quote from 2006, the new science was from 2012, so you're a little bit unfair. Um, and that's the same as us, we're reading the literature, we're getting smarter and we're using this knowledge to actually improve risk assessment methodology and also to increase or make it better the data requirements. So the situation presented to us today is not really the situation in Europe. It might be in the US, it might be New Zealand and Australia, but we are a bit ahead, a step further in Europe. I, I agree that you're ahead in Europe because I have worked with my regulator. Um, I, think what's, I think what's unfair is that that regulator was presented with information in 2004 and in 2005 and rejected it based on their assumptions. And, uh, which they had no scientific reason to do and wasn't precautionary and for which they had every bit of power available to them to ask the company to check. And they chose not to ask the company to check and that's what's unfair because their decision affected every single person in the world. Because they were part of the early um, set of regulators who made those decisions to release those crops. Interestingly, we had the same kind of effect with the high-lysine corn. And you're absolutely right that Europe is ahead because my regulator approved the high-lysine corn and the European Union said, go back and answer these questions. And two of the three questions that the European regulator asked the company to check were ones that came from us. So thank you very much. <laughs> In response to the European Union, Monsanto withdrew that product from worldwide production and refused to answer the questions. So I think that's the point, is that are we gonna use our assumptions? And if we're gonna use our assumptions, where do they come from? Why do the assumptions of my regulator become more important and more informed than the, assum the assumptions of the public? And you know, um, this dynamic between science and the public is skewed by the definitions of what we call the science and, and what we call being informed. Um, so it, it, I, I, think, um, I, I think that my regulator has made many good decisions. It's not, it's not that question. But they act in an arbitrary way and in a non-transparent way. And when it comes to the safety studies, it's not simply about making them available. It's about making the resources available for people to read them, understand them, and critique them. Because simply putting them online does not empower people. What empowers people is having the resources to come to agree with those studies or to disagree appropriately. So this, in essence, feeds into diversity of science and diversity of research, right? 
So I'd like to know from the regulators and the administration here, um, what kind of science and research would you like to see out there? Do you concur with having consensual groups declaring a consensus and discussion shut? So that there is no dis no research, no money um, allocated for people who are inquisitory and challenge certain dogmas, certain uh, assertions, or just statements like the ones I put out there, where we have every scientific reason and argument to challenge them and say this is I don't see that's true, and I would like to uh, research it. So what what are the sources that you you like to see? and you like to create and you like to support and keep alive or not um, monoculture or or a diversity and intercropping system <laughs> so one of the uh, regulators here want to respond to her questions for all of you <laughs> sequentially <laughs> so we need we need good research and <laughs> anyone right <laughs> we need good research and we need, we need as, as my colleague said we need, we need a, a, a transparent access to the research as well but as a matter of fact i'm not going to take any any position on what's the the point on the aim of the research, I think it's a political question and that has to be discussed in the parliament. <coughs> Do we have anything to add to that? I mean, yeah, who gets to discuss it? Because, I mean, we are seeing that parts of what, what we have, why we are here today, why we felt compelled and the organizers felt compelled to have a conference like this organized to allow even for a platform of, of a diverse debate and of, of critical challenging and critical debate, there's a reason for it because it hasn't happened and there has been massive pushes and we all have been alluding to it to quench and silence dissent to silence people who are asking the wrong questions, are producing the wrong data, are drawing the wrong conclusions, and are making their voices heard. There's, I mean, that is, everybody knows about that. There's been published a lot about it. So I'd like to get at that core how governments have also a duty and authorities have a duty, in my mind, to maintain a diversity and should be very happy and glad that there is diversity of views and that people are inquisitory and demanding to be heard and be supported, wouldn't it? It's a rhetoric question. Okay, so we have a question here from the audience, just very close to you here. Oh, oh I'm sorry, excuse me. And then you, I didn't see you, Michael, excuse uh, me. No problem, just, just a short reply. Yes, of course, this is important, and I think that's what exactly happens. Um, we're not just reading the dossiers submitted to us, we're reading the literature around that. So we're reading the papers, we had an enormous debate with EFSA, with everybody. So I, I don't think it's true that this is not heard, and there is also a reaction up to it. So the data requirements, they have changed over the years. It's just a question, innovation brings some risk with us. So do we want a zero risk society or a 1% or a 5% risk society? Very different, difficult question to answer, but that's our daily life. And we're trying to do our job as good as possible to read all the science. We also have the Swiss Science Foundation. Now they're running programs. You can be happy or not happy with the NFPs yet there was some money to do some research. So I think we are in a pretty good position in Switzerland. I think one of the problems with it is the, the way that science progresses is quite often, for example, with double-stranded RNA technology and the new sort of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, is that they're often fairly new techniques where there isn't a lot of stuff in the literature about what the effects might actually be. Um, so then the, uh, the, the, the organisation, the body, the, the company that wants to make money out of that technology will do some research and provide its research to a regulator and often there isn't much in the peer-reviewed scientific literature for you to be able to then to read. 
And it's not a criticism of a, a, a regulator, it's just kind of like the difficulty that you would have in trying to assess what's really going on when there isn't very much in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Um, and this often means in reality that um, there are new techniques that come onto the market without a thorough safety assessment being done because it just hasn't been able to be done, if you know what I mean. Like um, the materials haven't been available for independent researchers to be able to do safety assessments on them because they're all under patent protection and the company that owns the patent is the company that usually wants to make money out of the crop and they do their own research and they don't publish in peer-reviewed scientific papers and, and in journals until they want to and it becomes very difficult, the whole thing, to try and get a proper safety assessment early on. It, it takes a long time for people in, the, in independent researchers to be able to get the materials to test and to actually then do the testing and often that's years after the product's been on the market. Ja, ich staune, wie viel da darüber diskutiert wird, gentechnisch ja oder nein. Und niemand fragt sich, woher kommen denn die Krankheiten, woher kommen die Schwierigkeiten. Und wenn nur ein kleiner Prozentsatz der Forschung sich würde mit den Ursachen befassen, dann würde man nämlich herausfinden, dass die Natur gar nicht so blöd ist. Sie hat das alles zusammen reguliert. Und ich sage ein kleines Beispiel. Wir können immer neue Antibiotika erfinden, damit wir barfuß auf Betonboden den Winter überleben. Wir können aber auch warme Socken anlegen und das wird die Ursache der äh, Erkältungen und der Krankheiten erfinden. Und da haben die Bauern, die eine andere Wissenschaft haben, die Erlebnisse haben, die in der Wissenschaft nicht möglich sind, die werden überhaupt nicht zugelassen zu diesen Gesprächen. Danke. Uh, I didn't have my headset, so I couldn't understand what was said. I understand there was more of a statement than a question, and I'm sure many people here would like to make statements, but I, I think the best format from here on now would be for the audience to try to limit uh, what you say to questions for the panelists, and obviously in the process of asking a question, you can bring out some facts, but we'll try to uh, keep it less statement, more question. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of people who want to uh, speak. I'm gonna let you you choose who to give it to because. Well, a very general question to Angelica. When I listen to these discussions, it's many, uh, déjà vu, and I'm, I'm uh, wondering, from your point, you have been in this business, as many of you, for a long time, what changed in this risk discussion over the last few decades, I, I could say? Could you, just a general picture, or is it too big a question? So who would like to respond to that? Shall, shall we take maybe more um, questions and then... And then kind of give answers to, okay, that's a good idea. So Angelica has suggested fielding several questions and then and then the uh, the panel will be responding. Okay, so let's take a few more. Yes, I, uh, I will be. I will try to be very short and just ask a question without too much uh, discussion about it. How would you put the risk assessment within policy discussion? Because uh, when you talk about GMOs, new technologies you uh, promoting a certain model of agriculture, which will have as such consequences, like you will favor concent co concentration of corporations, you will favor uh, high monocultures. How do you put into the risk assessment the kind of funnel these technologies are getting, uh, are putting you to? No, I'm going to, revise the procedure that we just suggested. I think it's going to get a little difficult if we have too many more questions to remember. So I'm gonna stop it here. Let's, let's try to respond to the first question that was asked and then to this one and then move on. And you can do the other way in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> that was a tactic to buy me time to think about the answer. <laughs> so we have one question that I think, so we have two questions now, so let's deal with those and then move on to take some more. 
Right. But in part, the second uh, person who asked the question was giving part of that answer already, because you were addressing the model of agriculture, right? So what I see in the field of uh, the, the critically thinking broader circles of uh, science and social sciences, uh, political sciences, etc., who've been engaged in the debate over the decades, as you were alluding to. Um, we have shifted, when, when I started out at the beginning, early 90s, we were very much focused in like risks and is it safe or not, and pro and contra, GM and GMOs, etc., etc. In those circles, the debate has moved on today and has broadened quite significantly. So we are at a very different place of the debate than we used to be 25 years ago. We're going more towards questioning also the underlying models, the narratives that are behind uh, certain debates and certain visions about the world. You know, so because most of these the technology, and this remains the same now, that hasn't changed. The technologies that are being developed are fixes for problems that have been caused by a disruptive and an and a unnatural kind of agricultural model, the industrialization along economic paradigms, ignoring the ecological um, rules of the planet. And so that inevitably will bring you all the time into trouble because nature, you can't negotiate with nature. The rules are the rules and if you violate them, you will have problems and then you will have to uh, manage those problems. So many of us have been getting engaged in broader issues about innovation and progress, define what is progress, what is modernity, what is a modern agriculture. That's why I made a slightly ironic remark when I said modern agriculture 2003 declaring BT a cornerstone was clearly uh, the industrial model of the, which I would not call modern uh, by no means anymore. It's an old model, it's a destructive model, and it's a model on its way out. But the debates we're today having and are engaging in, it's, we sort of agree, and there's a emerging consensus that that model is on its way out. It has to be, uh, inevitably, we're losing the resources in it. But which way do we go from here now? So are we going further down and view solution options solely through technological fixes that either you can make money from the solution or there is no solution? Or do we go towards what the gentleman here uh, sort of addressed uh, with this uh, little metaphor, are we putting socks on, you know, when we realize we're getting cold feet when we're walking on, on in wintertime outside on a concrete uh, ground? Are we going to go to the roots and see where we have to change the system fundamentally? It's wiring, transform agriculture. So many of us are becoming engaged in, in debates about transformation, conversion of agricultural systems, etc. And then, once we have agreed, where do we want to go in the transformation of our agri-food systems? Which types of technologies will help us achieve that? And not that we view solutions already do we have a technology through which we can fix it? And unless it exists a, te a technology we can fix it, there is no solution. I hope I'm being clear on where we are going. So these are fundamentally different visions to approach problems and complexities of the problems we have. And I see us, um, as we sit here, certainly Jack and I have been quite heavily involved through the ISTAD and other uh, discussions into these fundamental questions on how can we rewire and how can we make modern systems that are working in line with the ecological rules of this planet. Otherwise, we're all doomed. That's at least our understanding of it. So that's where I see where we've moved on. But we feel ourselves being confronted with a lot of rhetoric and narratives that are still coming, what we are hearing since 30 or 40 years. And so that, that's where, where it becomes sometimes difficult because you're actually talking at completely different levels to each other. And to sort that out and deconstruct that and understand at what level are we talking, that maintains or remains to be a problem for me. Is that roughly an answer to your question? Should we take a few more questions? There's so many up at the end. Uh, a couple in that one. Uh, 
I hope it's a good one. <laughs> and it's accepted. Um, on the 1st of uh, September this year, the Federal Office of Agriculture presented its strategy, Plant Breeding 2015. So my question is, what role plays GMO in this strategy, according to the Federal Office of Agriculture? Well, I'm afraid I'm not directly involved in that, but essentially with a, a short answer would be, so that's two 2015 strategies, so essentially we don't know but there would to be strong words, there would be any GM or any any more in 50 years or 30 years from here. Essentially, we are already speaking that in new, some it's very hard to detect some of the new products. I think that there's a real issue of traceability that we can go to it later. But GM can be a tool, but actually not not any topic in that strategy because that's not. That's a very downward thing, and it's, it's the, I think the strategy, the aim of the strategy is really to a, a really high level sort of orientation of what actually the agro system might look like in the future. So there's no actual mention of it, I think, in the, that's, uh, that's strategy from, the, from our office. Yeah, okay. I don't think so. My name is Thomas Byrne, I'm a research professor at Genox Center for Biosafety in Norway. I think it's a pity that you haven't spoken much about the main technology that is on the market, which is herbicide tolerance. I've been doing some research on uh, GM soy, and that is now more than 80% of the world market. It's more than 200 million tons of GM soy. And we were lucky enough because it's not possible to get materials from the main companies that produce these uh, crops. So at one point we were able to buy some GM uh, soybeans from farmers in Iowa. And we tested the amount of herbicide residues and found out that uh, on average it was 9.0 milligrams per kilo. If you say that oh, this is representative for the 200 million uh, tons of uh, GM soy, that is 2,000 tons of pure glyphosate, eventually plus uh, elements of Roundup, that is introduced into the food chain, food and feed chain. So this is a unique pathway of pesticides into the feed chain and also into the food markets. Uh, this is unique for GM crops that you can spray while the plants are growing. So I think it's an extremely important risk that is not taken care of by EFSA because they have separate groups that work with pesticides and with GM plants. It's the same with the re regulatory unit in uh, Norway. And also, <coughs> this problem is magnified by uh, the testing, for example, feeding studies in 2013. It was 16 feeding studies on herbicide-tolerant uh, GM crops. 13 out of these 16 was not sprayed, as was mentioned in one talk here. So that the, the pesticides that are introduced into food and uh, feed is uh, really not taken care of by the risk assessment process. Um, this may be even more important when you have stacked plants that have several herbicide tolerance traits, so they can be sprayed with uh, Roundup, uh, glyphosate, glufosinate ammonium, 2,4-D, Dicomba, etc. So maybe we can ask the Swiss uh, unit how they managed to include the herbicides and pesticides in the risk assessment of GM crops that are the main part of the market. Thank you. <coughs> can I just support what you're saying? Um, to me, my interest is in the potential health effects of GM crops on people's health. And therefore you need to safety assess them in the way that people eat them. And that means that if you've got a, a GM crop that's designed to be sprayed with a herbicide or several herbicides at once, which we're now getting, um, then you need to safety assess that crop with those herbicides as it's as it, in the technology user agreements that farmers have to sign, it says how you're going to spray them, how often you're going to spray them, all that sort of stuff. So farmers are going to be spraying them along a certain criteria. Of, you know, you spray them here, you spray them there, you spray them with that, and that's as a, as a pathway that they, they have to do. Um, and it needs to be safety assessed after it's gone through that process, is my view. There's another question. Uh, sorry, I, I just also wanted to, to respond, uh, even though I'm not the Swiss regulator. Correct? <laughs> Although I can give you my CV. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's all I can ask. 
The, um, we just last year published some research. I think, I think Thomas's question is, is really good and his background is really good because um, we, we tend to focus on one issue at a time, but we are, we are producing products. And the vast majority of GMOs uh, in commercial use are technology pro uh, packages. They are not individual things. Uh, and, and we have also been looking at the effects of these herbicides. And we, we published just last year that the three uh, biggest herbicides in use in the world, uh, or three of the biggest, number one being Roundup, and, um, and in various sectors, three, four, and five, Dicamba and 2,4-D, which are also now going to be two of the largest herbicides to be used on GM crops with Roundup, so all for two or three of those will be on routinely used in the new generation of old generation GMO crops. We found that each one of those commercial formulations, when, when bacteria were exposed to them, they became resistant to clinical antibiotics. So it wasn't that their response was just to the herbicide. The herbicide was relatively non-toxic to the bacteria, but these bacteria acquired an increase in their ability to grow in the presence of medicinally important antibiotics, and the effect was detected well below application rate. So how you define what is important in a toxicity test, or how you define what the uh, boundaries of that risk assessment are, determine what you can see. A point Judy made earlier, and uh, in, in, an, uh, in an attempt to not ask these questions, the technology moves ahead and, and regulators are forced to only deal with the science that the companies make available to them. I think we have another question. Yeah, Michael wants to uh, make a statement. Well, I don't know if I want, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's a good point. That's true, what you say. It's the same thing in Switzerland. Um, it's not a data requirement right now. It might be in the future. The question is really, why? What's the hypothesis? Is there a synergistic effect? Is there something behind it? If there is, yes, that's probably something we have to take into account. Um, the Swiss situation is slightly different, probably by luck. We only have four approved GMOs for food. We have a few more for feed, but they're not used. So actually, for, for safety, for the public, that's not an issue. For the methodology, it is, I agree, and that's something we have to look into. Another uh, question from the, okay, we have one here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, my question is that we are doing all this uh, exercise since 20 years for ha not having famine in the world. This is what I presume. But uh, first, uh, why we have to, to manipulate all, all these genes before knowing, you know, the real risk assessment for you for a sure one. Because while uh, all these 20 years, still 70% of the food of the world is produced by uh, family farming and small scale agriculture. Uh, I don't know why we want to make our farmers beggar of this corporation. This is a very important issue that I'm working in many countries and I, I really Mean, mean to what you say. And uh, why uh, we don't have also to put half of this money that we are giving to the corporation to go to the alternatives? Agroecology, uh, increasing biodiversity land races, that I'm working 10 years on that and I have a wonderful res results on the name of evolutionary plant breeding and using. Uh, at the end of the day, we say there is a famine, and otherwise, we are using uh, agriculture for agrofuel for uh, all these problems that I, it's not a main reason I have not enough time. That's why we need, I think that this knowledge gaps for the risk assessment is for a while, we have just only to research and not to produce and to make all these people sick, and we don't know, we have to really go in this kind of risk assessment. Thank you. Other questions?
Yes. Oh, yeah, but she's given the mic to somebody there. Too slow. She's kind of nice. Yes, my name is Les Levendel, Open University, in the disunited kingdom. But my question follows up the earlier points about the test replacement in both the BT maize and the herbicide tolerant crops. Another name for this was really raised in the early debate in the 1990s, namely that a genetic treadmill would supplement the well-known pesticide treadmill, which has been known since uh, the large-scale use of pesticides, namely that these would generate pests resistant to pesticide and thereby necessitate its replacement by yet more or different pesticides. And now we see this phenomenon, which was predicted a long time ago, complicating, at least, the, both the BT maize and herbicide tolerant crops. Now, this is a, a commercial problem for the farmers and companies. It's also an environmental problem because it can mean, depending on the solution, it can mean something worse or, or the loss of something that was better. So several, and it, it's for also complicated by the issue of blame. As Angelica explained, the advocates of BT maize claim that this difficulty is not caused by the product, no. It's caused by other factors, by the wider context, by other practices, and so on. And of course, this is a well-known argument in the whole history of technology. The benefits of new technology are always due to the technology or the new product, by definition. While the disbenefits, the difficulties, the harm, are always due to something else. This is, this is the fundamental ideology of technological progress. And here we see it illustrated by the case of the pest replacement problem. So uh, several questions follow. How do risk assessment procedures and criteria anticipate this pest replacement problem? How do they evaluate the environmental disadvantages or environmental harms that could result both from the pest replacement and from the subsequent solutions to that problem? Excuse me, and, we, right? we only have and, a few minutes and, left, and, so and, let and me one let the panelists answer, address those two okay. questions. One more question, time for and, and how does risk assessment assign blame? No, and anticipate in advance where they will assign blame. Okay, so to the let's, product or the wider practices and so on. Let's have the panelists respond to those questions. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the question. That's actually write down my notes <laughs> I took prior to coming here. Um, what you're addressing is in, indeed one of the root causes of the debate and the problems. You know. I call it asymmetries, others call it double standards, whatever you want. But what we do have the reality today is, and that goes all the way to lawmaking, regulation, legislation, etc., is holism versus reductionism kind of thing. Holism is practiced today, very much so. It's for the benefits, okay? The, whole, the, the benefits that as a package come with all its knock-on effects, is as holistic as you can wish it. You know, it ends with kids being able to go to school and saving whatever from whatever pestilence and problem out there. That's vastly holistic. It's all put on the balance sheet of one technology. And when you then try to apply that same breadth of assessment, just sort of on the other side, okay, so what are the costs? What are the risks? What is What, what do we have to pay for getting that enormous benefit, then all of a sudden that scale, the radar of the risk becomes very, very tiny. Then it reduces to, no, we're only shooting genes in nuclei. The rest is out of our scope and responsibility. It's the others to blame. And that is what I try to show with this little example with the Western bean cut one. Had you done or had you applied the same breadth, had you weighed risks, costs with the expected benefits at the same scale 
on the same level with the same breath, you would have put that organism, would have made it on your list, you would have understood that you would buy yourself a problem when doing that because you will tilt the balance out there. That's all known. None of this is, is, is science that we, we claim we didn't know. Today we know this. this I studied this 25 years ago, Introduction Insect Ecology 101. You learn about these things. You could know them if you wanted to. We have the people to know it, we have the system, we have the capacity but we choose not to. And that's the debate that we all need to engage in. How broad, how do we want to balance our risk and benefit assessments? Right now, it's massively tilted. The, the benefit assessment is fully holistic, but the risk assessment and the safety assessment is as narrow and as reductionistic. Isolated components taken out of packages, looked in isolation, and conceived as a linear sum of its parts that might or might not happen, and then assigning those to different stakeholders away from the technology developers. That's, for me, what I really want to see change, and where I'd like to convince people and the public that we have to rethink our regulations, we have to rethink how we look about progress, innovation, all of these debates that need to come. On that eloquent that. note, I think we're going to need you to wrap up this session and have a lunch break. I do want to mention one very important point that most people don't understand. According to United States food safety law, when it comes to food safety, it's actually not only irrelevant to try to factor in benefits, it's illegal. The uh, new additives to food have to be demonstrated safe to a reasonable certainty of no harm, and you can't factor in potential benefits. And that's something very important, and I think that, when it comes to food safety, has to be taken into much greater account.